Hey everyone, today we are going to dive into mail servers, the real backbone of email systems. A mail server is a computer system responsible for sending, receiving, and storing email messages. It acts as a virtual post office that handles the entire email flow, allowing users to communicate over the internet. So when you hit send, your email client like the Gmail app sends the email to Google's outgoing mail server using SMTP. Now the email is in Google system ready for further processing. Google server performs a DNS lookup to identify the correct mail server for the recipient's domain, such as Yahoo's MX or mail exchange server for an at yahoo.com address. This lookup helps Google find where to send the email next. And once Google has the MX record, it begins transmitting the email to Yahoo server via SMTP. The email might pass through multiple network routers or relay servers, ensuring it reaches Yahoo. And finally, the email arrives at Yahoo server where it is processed, filtered and stored in the recipient's mailbox, waiting for them to open and read it. In this video, you will not only learn more about mail servers, but we will also do a high level system design. So let's get started. Just like physical mail needs a post office for sorting and delivery, email needs a mail server to handle sending, receiving and storing messages. The two main types we'll focus on today are the outgoing mail server, usually using SMTP, and the incoming mail server, using either IMAP or POP3. Together, they keep our digital communication flowing smoothly. When you hit send on an email, your email client, such as Outlook or Gmail, connects to an outgoing email server via SMTP or simple mail transfer protocol. The SMTP server checks the domain of the email recipient, say at yahoo.com to identify where it should go. Now, to actually find Yahoo server, the SMTP server performs a DNS lookup. Think of DNS as the internet's address book. Its goal is to locate the recipient's mail server or mail exchange records, basically the coordinates of Yahoo's mail server. With the MS record in hand, our email is ready to be handed off to Yahoo's mail server. Here is where things get interesting. The email might pass through several intermediary relay servers and these are like transfer stations along the way, each one ensuring your message stays on track. Some relay servers belong to ISPs, others to backbone providers that make up the internet's infrastructure. The email travels through these networks using secure protocols, thanks to BGP or Border Gateway Protocol, and a system of peering agreements between internet providers. And all of this happens in milliseconds. Now. The internet is made up of thousands of autonomous systems or AS, large networks owned by ISPs, backbone providers, data centers, and large organizations like Google or Yahoo are the autonomous systems. BGP is responsible for figuring out the most efficient route for your data to travel across multiple networks. Routers within each AS advertise their available routes to neighboring ASs using BGP. These advertisements include information about the paths and metrics that help determine the optimal route, considering things like distance, connection speed, and agreements between networks. So, as your email leaves Google network, it is routed through various intermediary networks such as ISPs or backbone providers before reaching Yahoo's network. Neither Google nor Yahoo manually selects each ISP along the way. Instead, BGP dynamically routes the data based on real-time network conditions and the routing policies of each AS. All right, so our email finally arrives at Yahoo's mail server. Now what happens? The email is stored on the server in the recipient's inbox until they log in to retrieve it. At this point, the recipient's email client, whether it is on their phone, laptop, or browser, uses either IMAP or POP3 to fetch the email. IMAP or Internet Message Access Protocol keeps emails on the server, allowing access from multiple devices. Whereas POP3 or Post Office Protocol 3 downloads the email to one device and removes it from the server. And it's a great option if you want offline access, but again, it's less flexible. This layered approach allows emails to reach its destination securely and efficiently while relying on various network resources. Now, if you are curious about setting up your own mail server while it's rewarding, it's a bit like running your own post office. Here is a high level view of the process. You first register a custom domain like example.com so your email can use at example.com. You then set up a dedicated server, a VPS from other providers like AWS, Linode, or DigitalOcean will do. 
most mail server software is optimized for Linux. You then have an instant mail server software. You use an SMTP server like Postfix or Exim for sending emails and Dovecote for IMAP or POP3 if you want to retrieve emails. You then configure the DNS with MX, SPF, DKIM and DMARC records. And this step is essential to route emails to your server and keep them secure. These records authenticate and protect your domain from spammers and spoofers. And then you use softwares like Spam Assassin and Clam AB that can help with filtering out spams and viruses. And finally, tools like Roundcube provide a browser-based inbox so you can manage your emails like on Gmail, but with your own domain. Setting up your own mail server might not be difficult, but it requires maintenance, monitoring, and ongoing security updates. But if you are up for the challenge, it's a great way to control your communication. In this video, we are not going to do that setup, but we'll be deep diving into the system design aspect of it. Now, before we proceed, note that a regular server isn't typically configured for email processing. Mail servers are specialized for handling email-specific tasks and protocols. They support email protocols like SMTP, IMAP, and POP3, which aren't configured by default on regular servers. Email can experience delays due to network issues, so mail servers use queuing mechanism to retry delivery if needed. Regular servers lack these robust retry mechanisms. So clearly, designing a robust mail server system involves integrating several key components to ensure efficient email delivery, storage, and security. Let's explore each component and its role in the system. At a high level, a mail server system includes a few key components. SMTP servers handle sending and receiving emails over the network. Mail retrieval servers manage email access through protocols like IMAP or POP3. And then we have mail storage system, which stores email messages and attachments securely and efficiently. You can also think of a user authentication service that keeps user logins secure. A web and mobile interface for users to access and interact with their inboxes. A spam and virus filtering service that protects against unwanted and malicious content. And then of course we'll have database systems to store metadata, user profiles and email indexing information. Let's explore each component, its function and how they interact with each other. The SMTP servers or the simple mail transfer protocol servers are the backbone of email delivery. They handle both outgoing and incoming emails. So when you send an email, the SMTP server reaches out to a DNS resolver to find the recipient's domain mail exchange record. The record tells SMTP server where to deliver the email. If there are multiple MX records, they are prioritized based on preference values. And to speed things up, SMTP servers cache DNS lookups, reducing latency for frequent addresses. In order to scale the SMTP servers, the servers are typically deployed behind load balances to handle high email volumes. Rate limiting and logging are in place to prevent abuse and ensure smooth traffic flow. In essence, SMTP servers are like their mail carriers of the system, ensuring emails get from point A to point B as securely and efficiently as possible. Once emails are on the server, we need a way for users to access them. That's where mail retrieval servers comes in, using protocols like IMAP and POP3. Like we have seen before, IMAP keeps emails on the server, making it ideal for users who access email from multiple devices. POP3, on the other hand, downloads emails to a device and often deletes them from the server afterwards. Like SMTP servers, IMAP and POP3 servers are deployed behind load balances to manage high traffic. The setup keeps things responsive, even with a larger user base. Now, let's talk about where all those emails actually live. Mail storage systems are designed to store massive amounts of email data while keeping it accessible and secure. So let's say each user sends or receives around 20 emails daily with an average email size of 75 KB, including the attachments. So for 10 million users, that's about 15 terabyte of data every day. Over a year, we are looking at around 5.5 petabytes. So daily storage is about 15 terabytes per day. And our yearly storage is 5.5 petabytes per year. And to handle all this, we use distributed storage solutions. So for attachments, object storage like Amazon S3 or HDFS will work well. For metadata and indexing, a NoSQL database like Cassandra provide high-speed retrieval. We replicate data across multiple data centers and use erasure coding for efficiency and fault tolerance. This ensures that even if some storage nodes fail, no data is lost. In short, the mail storage system is like a massive filing cabinet, structured to handle immense amount of data while keeping everything safe and easily accessible. Now, 
For a full functional email system, users need web and mobile interfaces, just like what you see with Gmail or Outlook. So scalable web servers like Nginx or Apache sit behind load balancers, handling traffic and serving for the user interface. You can expose RESTful APIs for both web and mobile clients. And these APIs are secured with authentication and rate limiting to ensure safe and smooth access. These interfaces provide users with seamless responsive experience, bridging the backend services and the frontend experience. Furthermore, every secure system needs an authentication service to ensure only authorized user access it. So for secure logins, you can use OR2.0 and strong hashing algorithms like Bcrypt or Argon2 to store passwords. And we add multi-factor authentications or MFA for an extra layer of security. This component ensures that every login is secure, protecting user accounts from unauthorized access. One of the key features of any mail server system is spam and virus filtering, keeping your inboxes safe. No one wants spam or viruses in their inbox, right? And that's where spam and virus filtering service comes in. So we use machine learning models like knife-based classifier and logistic regression to filter out spams. Blacklist and whitelist help refine these filters. Then you can integrate your antivirus software scans attachments and email content to catch any malicious files before they reach the inbox. You can also include a real-time feed that helps us stay updated on the latest threats, adjusting your filters as needed. This filter sits right in the email pipeline, scanning every incoming message to keep users' inboxes clean and secure. Behind the scenes, our database system stores the metadata, things like user profiles, email indexes, and configurations. So we can use databases like MySQL or PostgreSQL for structured data. Sharding and replication ensure scalability and reliability. For quick access, we use in-memory caches like Redis or Memcached to store frequent access data. These databases act as a backbone of our system, managing metadata efficiently and keeping the system responsive. And here is the list of some important tables from the context of mail server functionality. Each of these tables interact with others to form a comprehensive mail server backend, handling everything from user profiles to secure email transmission, storage, and retrieval. Users table stores information about each user of the email service. Each user has a unique user ID and basic profile details. Emails table records each email sent or received by users, linking each email to the sender, recipient, and associated metadata like subject and timestamps. Folders table manages folders for organizing emails like inbox, sent, drafts, etc. with a relationship to the user ID. This is a many-to-many -many relationship table, linking emails to folders, allowing an email to be associated with multiple folders, for example, inbox and important emails. You also have an attachments table that manages email attachments, linking each attachment to an email ID and storing relevant metadata. Spam classification table is crucial for our topic. This table stores information about emails flagged as spam, either by machine learning algorithms or by user reports. Now, this is not a full list and the design can be further optimized or expanded as necessary to suit more specific requirements. All right, so that's pretty much at a high level about databases. Now, let's not forget reliability and security, which are also two crucial aspects of any mail system. So for data replication, we store multiple copies of each email across storage nodes with replication across different data centers. This protects us from data loss due to server failures. You can have regular backups to long-term storage and a solid disaster recovery plan, ensuring we are prepared for the unexpected. In terms of security measures, we'll have data in transit, for which we use TLS or SSL encryption for all communication, from SMTP to IMAP to HTTPS. For data at rest, we have disk level encryption which protects emails and sensitive data stored on the servers. We also implement role-based access control or RBAC and enforce OAuth tokens for API access. And finally, we'll have auditing such as detailed logs of system activity which helps us detect suspicious behaviors and ensure compliance. These measures create a robust mail server environment that's secure, reliable, and resilient against failures. Finally, for any mail server, Managing high volumes of spam efficiently is crucial. So we will have a pre-queue filtering. That is, before even accepting an email, we verify sender's IPs and use techniques like gray listing to reduce spam. We apply rate limiting and content analysis. That is, we limit the number of emails from single IPs and analyze email content for spam characteristics. 
You'll also have spam processing pipeline. So by using tools like Apache Kafka and Apache Storm, we can create a scalable pipeline that can process emails in parallel, keeping performance high. These layers of protection allow us to process large volumes of spam without impacting system performance. From handling millions of emails a day to keeping inboxes secure and spam free, every component has a role in making the system robust and scalable. I hope this breakdown gives you a clear picture of what's happening behind the scenes every time you hit send. And if you have enjoyed this breakdown, don't forget to like, subscribe and check out my other videos on system design.